Welcome back children. In our last class, we had done the cell membrane, its structure, functions and behavior of cells in different solutions. Now, today in this class, we will be mainly concentrating on two important structures of the cell, which are the cell wall, nucleus and a brief overview of cellular organelles. Now, first, we will begin with the cell wall. Children, all of you know that in plant cells, okay, there is an additional layer covering the cell membrane. This additional layer that covers the cell membrane is called the cell wall. Okay, this cell wall is a very characteristic feature in plant cells, in fungal cells and bacterial cells because they possess an additional layer covering the cell membrane. Let us understand what are the unique features of this cell wall. Cell wall, as you can see, okay, this cell wall which covers the cell membrane in plant cell is a non-living, it is a rigid and a freely permeable layer which is found in bacterial cells, fungal cells and plant cells. Now, when a plant cell is young, children, when it is in the growing phase and when it is young, there is only a single cell wall covering the cell membrane. This cell wall is called a primary cell wall which is generally present in young plant cells. But as the plant grows mature, as the plant becomes older and older, there is accumulation or deposition of a secondary as well as a tertiary cell wall beneath the original cell wall that is the primary cell wall. See this is the primary cell wall, beneath it is the secondary cell wall and beneath it is the tertiary cell wall. So when there is deposition of secondary and tertiary cell wall, the plant becomes extremely rigid and the plant cells become dead. And this deposition of the secondary and the tertiary cell wall is not of cellulose. It is of even a tougher polymer which is called lignin and suberin. The primary cell walls which are present in young cell cells, plant cells, is generally made up of cellulose which is a long unbranched chain of thousands of glucose units joined to each other. Since cellulose, lignin, suberin, these are all very tough polymers, they give immense structural strength and rigidity to plant cells, fungal cells, etc. And these cell walls also have narrow pits inside. See, when there is deposition of secondary and tertiary cell wall, for maintaining connections between the adjacent plant cell walls, there are pores or pits which allow intercellular connections. That is, there are cytoplasmic strands which connect the cytoplasm of the adjacent plant cells. Because of the presence of the thick layers of cell wall, easy movement of substances in the adjacent plant cells is not very possible. Hence, there are cytoplasmic connections or pores which are actually connecting the adjacent plant cells. These cytoplasmic connections are called plasmodesmata. I am repeating, the cytoplasmic connections connecting the adjacent plant cells, allowing the cytoplasmic content to move from one cell to another are called plasmodesmata. Right? Now, you must also understand that if we have seen the characteristic features of the cell wall, it is basically maintaining the shape of the cell. It is protecting the plant cells, fungal cells, etc. from mechanical injury. It is giving mechanical support against gravity because generally the plant grows in the direction opposite to gravity. And it is because of the presence of this rigid cell wall that aerial parts of the plant are able to keep erect and withstand all kind of environmental stress. And the plasmodesmata within can actually 
allow exchange of substances in the adjacent plant cell wall okay so let us brush up the features of the cell wall that i just explained that the cell wall is a non living rigid and a freely permeable layer that covers the cell membrane in plant cells fungal cells as well as bacterial cells now children as i stated that in plant cells the primary cell wall is made up of cellulose which is an insoluble polysaccharide that is a tough polymer made up of several glucose units because saccharide means sugar and poly means many so when many glucose or sugar units are joined together it forms a long chain of thousands of glucose units which is called a polysaccharide then the mature plant cells when they grow older they show deposition of a secondary wall as well as a tertiary wall beneath the primary cell wall and as i had just explained in the diagram to you right these primary and secondary cell walls are made up of lignin and suberin now the cell wall has narrow pits holes or pores you can say for intercellular connections and exchange of substances between the adjacent plant cells these pores which maintain connections are called plasmodesmata is it clear children so these are the features of the cell wall now coming to the functions of the cell wall the cell wall maintains the shape it protects the plant cells from mechanical injury it gives mechanical support against gravity and it is due to this cell wall that aerial parts of the plant are able to keep erect and the plasmodesmata within the adjacent plant cells allow exchange of materials between the cells now children we are going to learn the behavior of the plant cell in two types of solution hypertonic solution and hypotonic in my last lecture only i had explained to you that hypotonic means dilute and hypertonic means saturated or concentrated solution so let us see how the plant cell will behave in hypertonic and hypotonic solution for that let us see this diagram children whenever you will place a plant cell in hypertonic solution okay a solution where the solute is more and solvent is less that is water molecules will be less then what will happen to the plant cell when a plant cell which is perfectly in a perfect condition if it is placed in a hypertonic solution you can see it will lose water through exosmosis because the water concentration inside the cell is more and outside it is less so the water will start moving in the outer medium now unlike the animal cell you will see a difference here in the plant cell that the entire cell does not shrink because there is an additional covering of the cell wall which is a very rigid layer okay the cytoplasmic contents leave the cell wall when the water moves out and they start moving the contents move in the center the vacuole also loses water cytoplasm loses water so rather than shrinkage of the entire cell the cell membrane along with the cytoplasmic contents loses water keeping the cell wall intact the way it is and finally when you will see that the water has been lost the ce ce cellular protoplasm aggregates or assembles in the center like this okay this kind of a phenomenon where a plant cell loses water by exosmosis when placed in hypertonic solution is called plasmolysis plasmolysis is the shrinkage of the plant cell where the cellular protoplasm moves away from the cell wall and concentrates in the center this kind of a cell is called a plasmolyzed cell 
Now, when I put a plasmolysed cell, this kind of a cell, again in a hypotonic solution where the water is more, then again water will enter inside, the cytoplasm will again start moving back to its original position and then it will regain its complete stature the way it was before. This phenomenon is called deplasmolysis. Again, I am repeating, when a plasmolysed cell is again kept in a dilute solution, again it will gain water due to concentration difference and it will regain its original shape. So, this phenomenon which is the opposite of plasmolysis is called deplasmolysis. Okay, now I will explain to you one more concept is that this was when the plant is kept in hypertonic solution. Now, if I place a plant cell in hypotonic solution, that is a dilute solution. Now, what will happen? Since there is an additional covering of the cell wall, okay, then you have the cell membrane inside. Okay, now when you have placed the cell in a hypotonic solution, that is a dilute solution, obviously due to more water outside and less inside, water will move inside through endosmosis. So, obviously the cell will swell. Okay, the cell has to swell. But unlike animal cells, which can undergo bursting also if there is excess of entry of water. The plant cells can withstand this bursting process when they are placed in hypotonic solution. Reason behind that when water enters inside, okay, this pressure exerted by water that is entering inside on the cell wall is called turgor pressure or water pressure okay now when water enters through endosmosis obviously it will exert pressure on the walls because it is entering inside but if too much of entry takes place there is a possibility that the plant cell will burst but it does not happen why because this additional covering of the cell wall it exerts wall pressure in the reverse direction and equally to the turgor pressure. So, when the wall exerts equal pressure in the reverse direction, which is equivalent to the turgor pressure of the water, water is pushing from inside and the wall is pushing from outside towards the inside, right? So, what is happening? Both are being balanced and as a result, bursting does not take place because the wall pressure that is exerted by the cell wall does not allow more entry of water inside and it prevents the plant cells from bursting. So we can say that plant cells, if they are placed in hypotonic medium, they can resist or withstand bursting due to the presence of cell wall. I hope it is clear children. If you have any doubts, you can further ask me also. So let us see what is the behavior of the plant cells in hypotonic and hypertonic. Just a recapitulation. When a living cell is kept in hypotonic, it will gain water through endosmosis. But it does not burst because of the presence of cell wall. Cell wall counters the turgor pressure by exerting the wall pressure which is equal and opposite. Hence, inhibiting excess of entry thus withstanding dilute hypotonic medium. On the contrary, when the plant cell is placed in hypertonic or concentrated medium, it will lose water through exosmosis. So, the cytoplasm along with the plasma membrane will shrink and this phenomenon is called plasmolysis as I had just explained through the diagram. If a plasmolysed cell is immediately placed again in hypotonic or dilute medium, the water will enter again and the plasmolysed cytoplasm will regain its shape. This process is called deplasmolysis. 
so i hope children you are clear with the characteristics functions and the behavior of plant cells in different solutions proceeding further to the next organelle that is the nucleus now children all of you know that in eukaryotic cells you have a well defined nucleus which appears as a dense body now this nucleus in case of eukaryotic cells is very clearly and distinctly seen but in case of prokaryotes it is an undefined nuclear region that is called nucleoid now in animal cells there is lack of vacuoles as a result the nucleus is centrally located because in animal cells vacuoles are not present but in plant cells most of the volume of the cell is occupied by the vacuole hence the nucleus is slightly present towards the edge or the periphery let us see the enlarged diagram of the nucleus to understand the parts of the nucleus you can see that nucleus is the largest organelle of the eukaryotic cell and appears as a distinct body controlling all the metabolic activities of the cell and it is the boss of the cell the highest coordinating center of the cell let us see the structure in detail now children just see this structure this is the structure of the eukaryotic nucleus which comprises mainly of four important parts there is a double membrane of the nucleus the outer membrane the inner membrane this membrane that covers the nucleus is called nuclear envelope this is the inner membrane and this is the outer membrane now covering this membrane okay inside inside is the cytoplasm within the nucleus which is called nucleoplasm the fluid within the nuclear envelope is called nucleoplasm what does it contain it contains a dense body which may be singly present or there may be many this is called nucleolus if it is singly present it is called nucleolus and if there are more then they are called nucleoli and you can see this network thread like structures which are present like an entangled mass in the nucleoplasm this thread like structures are called chromatin material chromatin material is a bunch of chromosomes which are present within the nucleoplasm and you can see these dotted structures which are actually the proteins or the ribosomes which are also synthesized inside so basically you can say that the eukaryotic nucleus comprises of four important parts the nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope the chromatin material nucleoplasm and the nucleolus now children see this nuclear envelope you can see it has got gaps in between it is not a continuous membrane these gaps are called nuclear pores okay since the nucleus is present within the cell there has to be exchange between the nucleus and the cytoplasm so this exchange is facilitated because of the presence of nuclear pores that's outer cytoplasm and nucleoplasm are connected they can exchange things between due to presence of nuclear pores you can see this nuclear nucleolus which is a rounded body it is rich in rna okay ribonucleic acid and nucleolus actually helps in production of the ribosomes that synthesize proteins you have learned this okay nucleolus produces ribosomes which then lies scattered in the nucleoplasm and when they move out of the pores they get attached to the membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum which are attached to the membranes of the nucleus okay so ribosomes are synthesized by nucleolus and hence it is called the ribosomal factory okay now coming to chromatin material these are made up of chromosomes chromosomes are thread like structures which are distinctly visible when the cell 
undergoes division right now the cell is not in a state of division so you can see the chromosomes present like an entangled mass but when the cell undergoes division the chromosomes separate and they appear distinctly at the time of cell division these chromosomes are made up of dna and the tiny units present on the chromosomes are called genes which code for several characteristics of an organism that is why we say that when an organism divides to produce the new cell or when an organism reproduces the characteristics of the parents are transferred to the offsprings because the genes present on the chromosomes are transferred from the parent to the offspring hence you can say the chromosomes present in the nucleus are responsible for transfer of hereditary information from the parent to the offspring so this was the structure of the nucleus and the functions of the nucleus let us brush up nucleus is the highest coordinating center in the cell and is the largest organelle in the eukaryotic cell it is centrally located in animal cells and it is present towards the periphery or edge in plant cells based on the complexity of the nucleus organisms or the cell can be eukaryotic or prokaryotic some cells have a single nucleus they are called uninucleate some cells may have two nucleus so it is binucleate and some cells of the body have many nuclei within the cytoplasm they are called multinucleate cells now the functions of the nucleus it takes part in the formation of ribosomes as i had explained to you that the nucleolus in the cell i mean inside the nucleus helps in synthesis of ribosomes it controls all the metabolic activities and directs the synthesis of proteins and since it contains genetic information in the form of genes in the chromosomes it also helps in transferring transmission of characteristics from one generation to another so basically you can say the nucleus has four important parts the nuclear envelope the nucleolus within the nucleoplasm the cytoplasm within the envelope that is nucleoplasm and the chromatin material present inside the nucleoplasm so children for today we have learned cell wall and nucleus and in my next class i will begin with other cellular organelles what are cellular organelles children cellular organelles are tiny subunits present in eukaryotic cytoplasm because prokaryotic cells do not possess membrane bound organelles and as i said there is division of labor even within the cell these tiny cell organelles will perform different different functions and we will take up two or three organelles at a time for your better understanding so for today this much is enough take care have a nice day